Welcome everyone to Building Healthy Eating Habits in Kids. My name is Claudia Zerlini. I'm a senior coordinator for the Sneakers Nutrition Education Program here at HSS. In today's webinar, we're going to talk about childhood nutrition, including what makes a balanced diet and how to encourage healthy eating habits in kids. I'm very pleased to present our and welcome our guest today, Laura Jabofsky, who's our pediatric clinical nutritionist, Dr. Melanie Pryor, who's a primary care pediatrician, and Karen Glass, who's a clinical social worker and pediatric social worker at HSS. I'm so glad to have you all here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So let's get started. And I think um, I'd like to start with a really general question um, that Dr. Fryer, I think you'll be able to answer. And what are some of the biggest concerns that parents often ask about kids and nutrition? Um, well, that's a great question to start with, Claudia. And um, I think overall, so parents do have a lot of questions just about what makes a healthy and a well-balanced diet at different ages. Um, for some of the younger kids, there can be a lot of questions about introducing new foods and how to deal with picky eaters. For some of the older kids, there might be more questions around what makes healthy and unhealthy snacks, um, how much soda and juice is too much, um, issues with breakfast and kids who don't want to eat breakfast. Um, so we get a lot of questions on how to manage those things. Um, and at, really at all ages, families do have questions about kids who have food allergies or special dietary preferences for the family and really what's safe and healthy for kids. Um, but really, I think a big point is just keeping in mind there's a wide variation of what's healthy for children. That's great. So what is healthy for children? What does balanced eating look like for kids? Um, are there certain key nutrients that should, children should be getting enough of? Laura? I think Dr. Pryor kind of mentioned it, but again, when we talk about balanced diet for kids, we want to make sure that they're getting a diverse mix of all the nutrients to help support growth and development. And again, it may differ across the lifespan as far as how much of those nutrients that a child or even an adult may need. But as far as what we want to make sure is in the diet, that's going to be the same. And so those are our whole grains, our fruits and vegetables, our healthy fats, but still in moderation, our lean proteins, which of course can be plant and animal based. And of course, we still want to make sure that we're limiting juice and soda and things like that. So when we're deciding, when we're making choices for our kids and helping our kids make choices, can their nutrition now affect their future development and health? Um, Dr. Pryor. Um, absolutely, which is why this is such an important topic that we want to dedicate the time to. Um, but nutrition really affects all different aspects of child development, both physical health, um, also uh, development and emotional health. Um, have, can have impact on learning abilities long term, um, can also have impact on medical conditions that are more typically seen in adulthood. Um, and I think also establishing these good nutrition habits at a young age really then establishes lifelong nutrition habits. Absolutely. And so we know that maybe all kids might not like to eat all food groups um, and that might affect their future development. So how can we tell what are some key signs of nutritional deficiencies um, as kids are growing? So that's a great question. So typically during childhood, um, we use a child's growth chart. And so I think it's always important. I always pull up the growth chart. I want every child of mine that I see, they should understand what their growth chart means. But that you have a growth chart that you're following from, in, from when you're born until 18. And so again, we're looking that the child is gonna stay on that growth chart and not have any large discrepancies. But what we look for is, are they growing the way that they should be and are they gaining weight adequately? The other thing is that we may see some physical signs um, in terms of maybe that their hair may be falling out or brittle skin, brittle nails or that dry flaky skin, trouble focusing in school as Dr. Pryor mentioned. But the really important thing to remember is that many of these nutritional deficiencies you may not see until it's a severe nutrient deficiency. And also we may not see them immediately. They may be happening later in life. So the greatest example of that is osteoporosis. It really happens from what we're doing early on in these childbearing years. And we'll see the results when we're much older. So that's why I always tell the kids is what we do now is these are the bones that we have until later in life. And that's why calcium and vitamin D, we may not necessarily see 
that somebody has that deficiency unless it's very severe, but we won't know until much later in life that they may have a problem. Laura, you use a great analogy that I remember from Sneaker about sneakers um, with the kids. Do you mind sharing that? So I typically tell um, my female patients, you know, I try to find out what it is they like. Obviously, at a certain age, they like shoes and bags, and that applies to my age as well. And so I say to them, if you got a really expensive, beautiful pair of shoes or bag, would you, you would want to make sure that you treat it really well. Their eyes light up. Oh, yes, absolutely. And then I explain to them, that's what their bones. And for the, the boys, I tell them a, a signed baseball card or a basketball by LeBron James or a famous a player that they admire. Oh, I would never do anything to that. And then I explained to them that that's really what their bones are and that these are the bones that we have from now till we're 100 and that you want to make sure that you build the strongest bones now because later on you don't have that opportunity to build it the way that you do now. And kids really get it and they really take to that um, kind of analogy. Yeah, I think it still can be a little challenging though trying to convince a child to care about their 80 year old self. Uh, <laughs> well, that's why if you tell them it's a, like a basketball player or they care more about that than their 80-year-old <laughs> self, that's a very good point. Absolutely. I really appreciate that analogy. Thank you. Um, so, Karen, this is where you come in when we're thinking about not just our physical health, but the mental and emotional health of kids. Can nutritional deficiencies affect kids in that way? Yeah. So, thanks so much, Claudia. So, I want to break apart this in two parts. So first, I want to talk about how nutritional deficiencies affect mental and emotional health. However, then I want to talk about how poor nutrition impacts academic and school performance. So while most people understand the connection between poor nutrition and physical health, which is exactly what Laura just kind of brought up, you know, imagining your 80-year-old self, many people don't really um, have the connection or realize the relationship between nutrition and mental health. So childhood and adolescence are critical windows of development. During this time, many psychiatric conditions emerge for the first time. And the most common mental health disorders that can be diagnosed in childhood are ADHD, depression, anxiety, and behavior disorders. Food plays a major role in our mental health. It impacts our mood, our anxiety levels, our ability to focus, and our brain function. In fact, diet is such an important component of mental health that it's inspired an entire field of medicine called nutritional psychiatry. Eating processed, sugary, and low-nutrient foods are linked to poor mental health in, in children and adolescents, including more emotional and behavioral problems. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but there's a um, journal called the Pediatrics Journal, which published a study which found that children and teens that consumed you know, fast food, junk food, sugar, and soft drinks, it was associated with a higher prevalence of being diagnosed with ADHD. Fortunately, there is very good news. So research suggests that go a good quality, healthy diet filled with fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, whole grains can be protective of our mental health and has been linked to better mental health outcomes. In fact, a study published by Harvard Medical School found that a healthy diet was associated with a significantly lower risk of developing depressive symptoms. Moreover, research has found that a better diet at baseline, just at baseline, was associated with better emotional well being, including higher self esteem and fewer emotional and peer problems. So, why am I you know, throwing all these research studies with, um, on you? What does it all mean? So while the relationship between what we eat and how we feel is complex and should not be viewed as a cure for mental illness by any means, it's important to note that it can have a significant impact. And that's why me, Laura, Claudia, Dr. Pryor, that's why we're here. We need to know how to build healthy eating habits in kids because it can impact your future in so many ways, mental health, as well as like Laura described. Um, physical health. Now, um, in addition to obviously mental health, I want to shift focus a little bit and talk about how nutritional deficiencies can impact um, your social and academic uh, performance. Education helps children learn how to think critically. It enhances their creativity and in their imagination, 
It will expose them to new ideas and it helps them find a career path that they wish to pursue as an adult. This is why school is of utmost importance to our child's future. Youth face a number of food-related concerns, such as poor nutrition, obesity, hunger, and evidence shows that healthy students are better on all levels of academic achievement, including academic performance, which is your grades, your test scores, education behavior, which is your attendance and your behavioral problems in school, and lastly, your cognitive skills and your attitudes, your concentration, your memory, your mood. And I wanna mention just a few studies that demonstrate how eating healthy foods and having access to nutritious meals can have a huge impact on your academic and school performance. The research has demonstrated that nutrition affects students' thinking skills, their behavior, and health. And all of that um, impacts your academic per performance. For example, evidence shows that not eating enough specific foods, your fruits, your vegetables, your dairy products, your, low, your lean proteins, that's just associated with lower grades. Diets and high in trans and saturated fats can negatively impact your learning and your memory. Nutritional deficiencies earlier in life, um, particular, I'm sorry, de nutritional deficiencies early in life, particularly zinc, B vitamins, omega-3 fatty acids, and protein can affect the cognitive development of school-age children. And nutritional deficiencies are also associated with lower grades and higher rates of absenteeism and tardiness. So finally, studies show that eating a healthy breakfast, such as participating in breakfast programs at school, plays a role in student behavior, cognition, concentration, energy levels, and academic performance. In fact, access to healthy foods, healthy foods and it will enhance a student's psychosocial well-being, reduce aggression in school suspensions, and decrease discipline problems. So putting this all together, I know I just gave you a lot of evidence, a lot of research. So drawing you know, about the mental health component, bringing what I just talked about, academic performance, what does this all mean? What's the bottom, what is the bottom line? And all boils down to this. Um, early life, adolescence in particular, is a time of transition to adulthood where many lifelong habits are being established. This time is highly important to establishing healthy eating habits and educating our young people on nutrition and food. You're going to have to start taking Karen around with me to see my patient. Yeah. <laughs> I know that was so long winded, but I felt like it was so important. Yeah, I agree. that's what I do. <laughs> it absolutely is important. And it's great um, when the research backs, you know, what we're trying to mm -hmm. do. Um, and exactly. that, we have that research makes, makes it even more powerful. Um, oh. One thing. Sorry, my light went off. <laughs> um, one thing you did mention was about the importance of breakfast and um, I, I just, I had a, a thought, Laura, um, what would of the most well-balanced breakfast be to prime our, our kids' brains for school? Yeah, so we definitely want to make sure that there's a protein because this way it can help establish that foundation and give that, and also if we can get a whole grain or a fiber because typically that's, it takes longer for that to digest. So this way it can last them until lunch. So typically I might recommend an egg or they can have oatmeal. And typically a great way to do that is you can do overnight oats and make it with the milk the night before. This way there's a little bit of protein with that whole grain. Um, worst case, I know some kids don't like to eat something. So even grabbing a banana, but pairing it with a string cheese or peanut butter or something like that, even if needed to have a some low fat chocolate milk is also a good option because at least we know that the child will get some protein. And again, the calcium for those strong bones. And I just want to add also, um, like I talked about some research about how, um, you know, breakfast is so important to kind of kickstarting your child's day and how it can impact everything from, you know, how you learn and process information to how you can concentrate and really grasp information that you get from teachers. Um, you know, there are many government initiatives that, you know, instill um, you know, healthy foods in schools and have programs for healthy eating. And obviously not every school is perfect. And so that's why it's really important for the parents 
to partner with your school. So if your school doesn't offer something like that, you know, meal plan and prepare in advance because, you know, the research speaks for itself. It makes such a difference in the world. Um, I, I did a lot of research and there are like a lot of dietary plans that um, parents can do and partner with this school. And any, like I said, the main thing is having healthy habits and trying to instill that with your child when they're young um, so they can practice on um, and do that as an adult. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Karen. So there are other kind of emotional aspects to eating, certainly when we think about um, eating habits. And so what about overeating or kids sneaking foods? Does this relate more to nutritional de deficiencies or is it an emotional concern that might need to be addressed? Laura, I think this one might be best. Yeah, take that. Um, so I think it is important. I mean, especially now when kids are kind of doing this in, in between learning where some are at home and some are in school. The idea of the kitchen being open is a problem that I'm hearing a lot from the parents and kids are constantly going into the kitchen and eating snacks. And then the mom or dad might say to me, but then they're not hungry. They're not eating at meals. Well, they're eating 900 calories in between their meals. So of course they're not ready to sit down and eat the sandwich when you want it, especially when you have a pantry filled with cookies, chips, goldfish, pretzels that I've heard a two or three year old climbing up on the cabinet shelf to reach them for themselves. So again, it comes back to the ideas that what are we keeping in the house and making sure that we're having healthier options in the house and also creating healthy relationships with food and how we incorporate them through the day. So the idea of constantly eating while it is something that I wanna do all day long, we really wanna make sure that we're establishing those healthy habits so that a child knows when they're hungry and can eat when they're hungry. We want to encourage that. But the idea of just mindless eating or mindless snacking isn't what we want. So even in the beginning, you know, having that discussion of these are the snacks and maybe having a snack time. And if the child really is hungry, I would never want to deprive that child of something to eat. But the whole idea is establishing that healthy relationship with food so that we learn our internal hunger cues to know when we are hungry, when we're not hungry, when we're eating because we're sad or because we're happy and making sure that we're not doing it for the wrong reasons and that we're doing it to support growth and development, which is really what food should be for. Absolutely. Uh, I want to add uh, just one more thing to that too. Um, so Laura said that beautifully and I just want to add something more from like that social work perspective. So if your child is sneaking food or, you know, overeating, I think it's important, and Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the most important thing is not to, you know, go to a punitive, you know, go to an area of shame. I think it's important to stay calm and not react negatively. I think that's the first step. And then from an empathetic standpoint, explore why your child is sneaking food or overeating you know are they in fact hungry and is it like you know a lack of resources or is it you know more emotional based and when you've gathered that information you can make a plan going forward that works for everyone and helps to heal and nurture your child's long-term relationship with food yeah i've been encouraging a lot of my uh, patients to actually have family discussions where, because I know many of us kind of fell off track during COVID, we may have been buying foods that we mm -hmm. have normally bought. And now people are kind of ready with the school year, just starting to kind of get back on track and right. revisit healthier choices. And so I encourage them all to kind of come together as a family, establish what are our healthy habits in the household and how we're going to do that together but together so that it's not mom exactly. and dad dictating right. and telling. Right. There are some things that mom and dad have to tell a child, but we want to make sure that the child feels included in the process 100%. and that they understand it and that they want to do it when mom and dad are not around. And that's really right. the important thing. Right. And that's exactly like kids need to know that they're in a partnership with their parents. Obviously parents, you know, are the parents and they have the bottom line but you want to have your kids included in that process, which I'll touch upon later, but you want to get your kids involved because that getting them involved and invested in their health is what's going to make those lifelong changes. Absolutely. So that, that's a great segue, Karen. Um, what are some strategies that parents can use <laughs> to model good eating habits and get, yeah. get children involved in food choices? So, um, 
I first want to talk about how kids can get involved in food choices. And then I'll bring in how parents, you know, can model and what some good strategies to have your kids eat those nutritious foods. So first, important to note, instilling healthy eating habits in children is an ongoing process and it takes time and patience. Um, it's not something that's going to happen, unfortunately, overnight. I wish it's as simple as that, but it's just not. So luckily, there are a number of strategies to get kids involved in food choices. So one, plan meals together. By planning meals together, um, it helps your kids um, get involved in the process and ultimately will have a say on what's going to be on their plate. Um, they also, by doing this, um, will have an interest in exploring new things and trying new foods. So for example, if you're sitting with your child and you're you know, inquiring you know, what, what meals would you want for the upcoming week? And your child says like, oh, I want a cheeseburger. I want a hot dog or, you know, X, Y, Z that are more or less unhealthy choices, but very, you know, age appropriate for your child. Use that opportunity to discuss the benefits of having an healthier option, like a veggie burger or a plant-based burger or a turkey burger. Use these conversations in the moment to provide learning opportunities. So number two, go grocery shopping together. So when you go grocery shopping with kids, you can teach them about food, nutrition, and healthy eating choices in the moment. You can literally tangibly hold something and discuss where this vegetable came from or this fruit came from. Um, and it's you know just a, a, an in-person, hands-on approach. It's also a good opportunity to start talking about food labels and having kids really understand, you know, why this option is better than that, that option. Um, so like, for instance, if you go with your child down the snack aisle and your, your child's, you know, adamant about wanting a neutral, like a, you know, specific granola bar, pull out, you know, the granola bar you want to get and pull out the box that they want to get and show them, like, look at how much more sugar is in this one. Look about, look at the carbohydrates and use this opportunity to explain and have them learn why this choice is better. You still give them an opportunity that like, I see you, I hear you, I want to, you know, satisfy your cravings and we can, but there's a healthier way to do that. So number three, preparing meals together. One of the most important tips for creating healthy eating habits and kids is bringing them into kitchen, bringing them into the kitchen to prepare meals. So regardless of your child's age, there's a job for everyone, whether it's reading the recipe, helping mix the ingredients, or chopping up vegetables. You want to give your kids small jobs to do and praise them for their efforts. So when I was growing up, you know, I'm on the shorter side and, you know, my mom wanted me to get involved very young. The first thing she had me do is set the dinner table. And soon, you know, my responsibilities increased as I got older. The main thing she had me do though is starting at the beginning of dinner time till when the dishes were cleared up, I was involved and I knew I contributed to that meal time. So I, you know, graduated from setting the table to, you know, owning this, this salad, you know, the side salad for dinner and I would tear the lettuce and eventually I would cut up the vegetables. By taking ownership, I got more involved. It's also important to be creative. So especially for your younger kids, cut foods into fun shapes, name foods that, you know, that your child helps make. You know, if your daughter Scarlett may help you, you know, peel the potatoes, you know, say this is Scarlett sweet potatoes and make a big deal about it and praise them for their efforts. Because this will make them so proud, they'll take ownership of it, and it will make them motivated to want to contribute for future meals. So when cooking becomes an enjoyable habit instead of a nuisance, that's really when healthy lifestyles um, and choices start to fall into place. So number four. Um, oh, so we make kale pancakes in our no, see? And my nephew, I explained to him, I said, these are Hulk pancakes. I cannot tell you how many pancakes. I mean, obviously we still control the portion, but right. he will ask for whole pancakes. 
and he does not ask for other pancakes or waff or his chocolate chip waffles anymore. He wants Hulk pancakes and he loves them and they are made right. in scale and they are delicious. Right, right, exactly. So it's getting the kids, you know, by naming it Hulk pancakes, it's just so much more enticing. And I'm sure, you know, he's, you know, want, you know, naming it and wanting it in the future, which is awesome. That's what we want to, um, you know, that's exactly what we want. So next, um, kids, um, and I, I don't know, Laura, you may have an opinion about this also, is kids should serve themselves. By serving themselves, kids will learn to make decisions on which food to put on their plates and how much to put on their plates. They'll learn to share and take turns and be responsible for their choices. And it also puts them in control of how much food to put on their plate. So if they need to go get seconds, they kind of, they own that and they have that choice. Um, and then finally, make meals a family affair. Create memories and traditions together. By making meals a family time, this can create a regular time each day to catch up, talk, listen to each other. Obviously, families come in all, you know, all different sizes, you know, could be a single mom with one child, you know, two parent household. However it is, try to focus on the meal and on each other. Turn off the TV, put away your phones, you know, don't get distracted by social media, texts, phone calls, you know, have this be a relaxing stress-free time to connect and talk about fun and happy things. And it also creates an opportunity to create memories and traditions together. You know, one of my favorite childhood memories is my family would routinely have spaghetti night. And every spaghetti night, my parents would do two things, which they still do to this day. They put on this soundtrack to Moonstruck, and it can only be the Moonstruck soundtrack. And then they light a candle that's connected to a Chianti bottle that has one of those drip candle waxes. So um, it's very colorful. And so every spaghetti night, we would have this beautiful Italian music playing and our drippy candle. And it created these lifelong memories and something that I'm definitely going to do for my future family. They also, which I thought was awesome, and they still do this actually now during COVID, They've created, they created themed dinners. So, you know, probably, you know, every few weeks or so, you know, a theme would be, you know, pirate themed. And we would all go to the grocery store and think like, what would pirates eat? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we would get involved in that process and it'd be so exciting or Hawaiian themed. And we'd make chicken with, you know, pineapples and we'd have like, you know, I would go pick some flowers and put it on the table. Um, my parents, like I said, you know, they do this still with COVID. Every Friday night, my mom makes a beautiful dinner table and they have a themed meal and they carry that out. And it makes things interesting and it gets kids involved. And it just, you know, you have to, you know, kind of spice things up and not be so monotonous and, you know, you know, keep things, like I said, interesting for meals. That's how our kids are going to get involved. Do and then, go ahead. What do pirates eat? <laughs> no. So I'm <laughs> so I mean my parents like would go crazy and like have like hats and like you know they would think about like maybe like chicken you know that type of thing. My dad might have a rum type cocktail, um, <laughs> not to have for kids, but you know the main point is you know having it fun and bouncing ideas off of each other. That's Karen, the whole thing. Yeah, Karen brings up a good point, and this is something that I talk to parents about a lot, is this idea of kids' meals. Mm -hmm. Kids eat what we tell them to. And so if we decide that a kid's meal is chicken fingers, hamburgers, hot dogs, and pizza, that is what the child is going to want to eat. If the child is offered salmon and chicken and broccoli, mm -hmm. they do not know that is okay for them to eat. There is nothing wrong with the child eating fish. In fact, most of the time it is my the parents who decide that their kid cannot eat fish because mm -hmm. that is not considered a kid-friendly food. There are right. no foods that are that should not be served, obviously, unless there's an allergy or safety concerns in terms of cutting foods up in the right size for younger kids. But if you think about places, 
in other parts of the world. Kids in India are having spices at a very early age. Kids mm-hmm. Um, Italy are having all of different things in their diet. Mm -hmm. We, as for some reason, have decided that our kids need to eat chicken fingers, french fries, and and hot dogs as Mm -hmm. their diet, and that that is good for them. But they can eat off of the regular adult menu, just the appropriate portions for their size. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So that actually brings up a good transition point of how, how can parents model good eating habits? So first you have to set a good example. So children are, you know, obviously they're influenced by what they see and what they hear happening around them. You know, they're very observant. They, um, so that's why it's important you set a positive example for your child to follow. You know, if you, if your child comes home and you're, you have a big bag of Taco Bell and a huge, you know, big gulp of soda, and then you're encouraging your child to eat clean and healthy, kind of a hypo- hypocrite. So you have to practice what you preach. You know, you have to model and eat balanced meals yourself and also try new foods yourself. Describe its taste, its texture, and, your, and its smell when you're eating because your kids are going to observe that you're open to new foods. Okay, then I might be open to new foods myself. That's a great theme night, new food night, where everybody tries and makes food <laughs> at the table, but you do it together as a family. Exactly. I'm going to establish that for us next time. Yeah. Okay. You <laughs> said. I also think it's important for parents to reward with attention and not food, which this is kind of piggybacking off of what Laura just brought up. You know, she explained that parents are choosing, you know, that hot dogs, um, you know, French fries and, you know, chicken fingers are the norm. Our society, you know, rewards, you know, you know, something good with sweet. Instead, we need to start learning to reward with like affection, with hugs and kisses or an extra story at bedtime or Mm -hmm. talk or like, you know, a date, you know, go get a manicure or something, whatever is appropriate with your family. Um, and then lastly, um, it's so important for parents not to be punitive. You know, it takes a child a long time to get used to new foods. And just because they don't like it, you know, the first time doesn't mean that they won't eat it later. 20 to 30 times it takes someone to decide if they exactly. like it. So, and Laura, you can probably branch upon this, but it's important when you introduce new foods, serve it with something you know your child likes and offer all, introduce only one new fido, one food item at a time. So additionally, children's appetites vary. You know, one day they might not eat much, the next day they're going in for seconds or thirds. The most important thing is not to react negatively or shame your child. Avoid lecturing or forcing your child to eat. They're their best regulators and they know, you know, they know what they need in order, you know, to feel good and to feel like they're thriving. Instead, as parents, we need to model and teach our kids the importance of moderation, healthy portion sizes, and balanced meals when it comes to making daily food food choices. Absolutely. Um, I just started liking olives, so I guess it took me 20 to 30 times. My husband hates olives, so you need to teach him too. But I, I literally, you know, spoon it. Like, I'm like, try this olive or a pickle the other day, and he's, he's, he's warming up to it. It takes time. And remember, as parents, it's also important how you respond to how when a child has a food. And again, this is important when a, in infancy when we're introducing foods, but it's the same later on as well. But if you make this face or you're going like this, it's very much observed and felt. So if you know that you're going to offer something, just give them, wow, that was a great job. I'm proud of you for trying that. That's a great line that exactly. works. It's neutral. It's giving positive reinforcement. And it's not letting them know that you're pro or against, it's just saying, I'm happy, I'm proud of you for trying something new. Right. That's the best thing, and it, again, it goes with what Karen is saying, you're giving your kid that positive affirmation, which is really what all kids are looking for. Yep. Absolutely, that's great. So we didn't really talk um, specifically about picky eaters, but I think there's a general theme that kids may, might be a little picky about their um, about what they're eating, either as a result of what we're serving them or just a result of 
how a child grows and develops, um, their, their eating habits and tastes. So if all else fails and you know a parent is having trouble getting a child to try certain foods or to eat balanced, um, balanced meals, is it sufficient to supplement with vitamins? And I think Dr. Fryer, this would be a great question for you. Yeah, I think um, everything both Karen and Laura had touched on really um, just so important to really encourage that balanced diet kind of as the first line um, and really using some of these strategies to work through um, foods that kids are refusing because the food really is the best source of all those vitamins and nutrients. Um, but that being said, there are some circumstances where a multivitamin would be appropriate um, and it's definitely important to talk to your child's pediatrician about that especially kids who have very erratic eating patterns or are on special diets, potentially for medical reasons, uh, vitamins can be a useful supplement. But even for kids who are picky eaters, fortunately, a lot of our foods are fortified with vitamins as well. So kids who eat cereal, even juice, milk, those things are excellent sources of vitamins, even if they are picky in other aspects. Um, and definitely just to keep in touch with your pediatrician about these issues as well. Yeah, Dr. Pryor brings up a great point. I think that's really important. There's a difference between picky eating and picky eating that could lead to a medical problem. And so making sure that you're really being in touch with your pediatrician and bringing those points to the, your visits and you know having a notebook to be prepared for that can be really helpful to kind of see if what you're experiencing is really very far off from what a typical kid who may like to push your buttons versus someone who may be experiencing a true problem that needs additional medical intervention. Exactly. So Laura, I think you just mentioned having like notes. Is it helpful for parents to come prepared with like a set of a uh, list of foods that their kids eat, a list of foods that they refuse to eat. Is that something that's helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think everything is always helpful to write down. And I think at that point, you know, sometimes while you may be going over certain milestones with your pediatrician, that would be a great opportunity for your pediatrician or if to either ask, oh, do you work with the dietitian closely? I know here at the hospital, we all know each other and refer to each other constantly, but that's very common also in private practices or in these large public offices that a child may go to, to have somebody on site who could help, or do you have a reference that I can go to who you know that you work closely with? Because it's always great to have somebody who kind of, everybody works together to kind of help that relationship happen. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, um, like aside from your pediatrician and a nutritionist being great resources, there are just a lot of resources out there on the internet as well. And mm -hmm. um, I definitely recommend healthychildren.org, which is the AAP's website. Um, and that gives just really good overviews of nutrition by age and um, even goes through some of the things that we talked about earlier with strategies for encouraging healthy eating. Uh, the CDC also has a great website as well. Eatright.org is another great one. The internet is a blessing, but it can also be a curse. So like Dr. Pryor is saying, make sure that you're going to credible websites to get that information. And there are credible websites or even ask your doctor, what are some websites that you recommend that I go to? Because don't just go to a random www.ihearteatinghealthy.com. I don't know it, but don't even look that up. But I'm just saying, <laughs> you want to make sure that it's from a credible where they're giving you the evidence-based guidelines of what's best for your child. So I think even beyond websites, it's getting a little more challenging because a lot of people are getting their information from Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, different social media. Um, and is there any tips that you might give? Because I know there are a lot of, there's a lot of content that might say, oh, this is what, like, this is how I feed my child. This is what you should do. Um, or these are great meals for a two-year-old, things like that. What can parents look out for? I think it's great for parents to serve as references for each other because, you know, having gone through it, you may have tips and suggestions, but I always caution my patients to say, it's one thing to ask this, but when they start giving maybe medical advice or saying, do this over that, that's where it becomes tricky. So if you're asking, like, is my child meeting their needs? That's not for maybe someone in your mom group or your dad group or whichever group to kind of make that decision. That's really for a medical expert who has the background and the training to really decide that. If you want to say, hey, do you have some ideas for some chicken recipes to get my kid to try? That's a very different kind of question. But when it comes to a medical, something that could affect the child's growth and development, that's really where you want to draw the line. I also encourage people to look in their bio if you are to see if they are a registered dietitian or someone who's certified in a certain area that that can really be 
but it can be very tricky. And so I tell people to stay off that stuff because it's not really the best way uh, to get the information. And a lot of the information is just wrong. So just because it's available doesn't mean that it's correct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if you are concerned about your child's nutrition, where's the best place to start, Dr. Fryer? I think like we mentioned, definitely checking in with your pediatrician and um, maintaining like the normal well visit schedule really is important. But then when any issues or concerns come up in between those, never being afraid to reach out. Um, and especially if you have concerns like both about their physical growth, but also about their development, like we had touched on earlier, those are really important um, indicators of a, a kid's nutrition. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. So I'd like to invite the audience to ask any questions. If you do have them, we have some time um, to answer some additional questions. Mm -hmm. As my computer tells us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, one question is, Laura, I think this is in reference to we mentioned earlier about being at home. Um, how important is it to stick to a schedule? My kids are learning on Zoom and want to eat all the time. Yes. Um, so that is actually something that I encourage all of my parents to do is to sit down, do that family meeting thing. And even you can write it out so it's on a board or a piece of paper or somewhere in the household, because then it kind of, that's what kids have in school. They don't just get to walk wherever they want to go. So it's kind of reestablishing that norm for this new norm that we're all experiencing. But to say, maybe you can plan in at 1030, you have a break between these two. That's when we're going to have snack time at 12 o'clock. That's going to be lunchtime. So it's using the schedule that they have. But again, with this schedule, it's not just with eating. It's also with sleeping. It's also with uh, physical activity. It's everything because that is really going to impact the well-being of the child as well. So when we talk about a healthy diet, that's one thing, but all of these things kind of play into each other to make for the best development of the child and to make sure that they're sleeping well at night and that they're able to wake up the next morning feeling energized to do their classes as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, another, I try to give my child food choices, but if I gave him choices all the time, he would only choose pretzels and M&Ms. How do I balance choice and me having the ultimate decision? Yeah, so I actually encourage um, choice, but the way that I work with it with my families is that I say, do you want an apple or a banana? Because if you give kids endless choices, it can become very challenging for them. So in terms of meal planning, I'll say, you can provide the two choices, let the child pick, because again, it's giving them that autonomy and making them feel like, oh, I did this, I'm in charge. But really it's mom or dad or whoever establishing what those options should be, and then they get to choose which it is. But again, if we just leave it open-ended of, do you want this, what do you want for dinner? They will say always, chicken fingers, french fry, all of those things. But if, would you like chicken tonight or would you like fish? Those are the two options. Those are your only two options. You pick what they are. That's, a, that's the way I like to deal with it because I otherwise exactly like what this, whoever was asking, you, your kid may only ask for pretzels and M&Ms. <laughs> I would. Um. <laughs> we'll talk about that after, Claudia. <laughs> um, along the same lines, my three and a half year old daughter wants to eat PB&J sandwiches three meals a day. Are there any healthier variations to this or any other ideas? Do you guys want me to take this or does anyone else want to get I guess the question is, why does your child only want to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? If uh, Maybe she would eat something else. So you can put something else in front of her. Again, she's three. You're the adult. So it's. I understand we don't want a child who's kicking and screaming. I guarantee you, if you leave the option in front of the child, they will eat it. They may not like it, but if they know that they're hungry, they are going to eat it. They have no other option and they are smart and they are in tuned with their bodies and they will know. But they also know that they can push who's ever buttons to get what they want. They are very, very smart creatures. And so they may kick and scream until they get what they want, which is peanut butter and jelly. But again, like Karen had mentioned before, it's about staying calm. It's about you know, keeping your composure to keep those healthy habits of what you're gonna to want to instill and to not kind of veer off in the opposite direction. And then from um, more specifically, Laura, only because I know you'll have some good ideas, <laughs> what would be the healthiest way to create a PB&J? I saw recently someone, um, and I tried this, it was pretty good, smashing raspberries as a jam instead of, you know, something in a jar or a can. 
Yeah, and I always encourage people um, to say, what sh what should, what's peanut butter? It's peanuts. So when you're looking at the label, the real, all that you need to see on the ingredients is peanuts and it may contain a small amount of salt. But so you can find that in the stores. And again, just because it says natural or health, it doesn't mean that it is any of those things. So look at the nutrition ingredients. And if it just says peanuts, or if you can take them, you can grind your own at some of the supermarkets, that's a great option. And then again, putting blueberries or raspberries, you can get them from the frozen section or fresh. And to do it that way, that's a great way as well. And serving it with a glass of milk is even better. <laughs> Healthy bones. That's, that's actually, that's a great segue. Another question that came up is, should I be concerned about how much dairy my child is eating? They love to drink milk. Well, I think we don't want your child to only be drinking milk because if your kid is having too much milk, it can lead to an iron problem. Um, and that is a concern that we have. We don't want your child to become iron deficient because that will affect their growth and development. Um, and so we don't want them to be consuming massive amounts. And so again, it's going to depend on which age of how much calcium they should be having. And again, on the flip side, if your child cannot drink milk, there are plenty of ways for your kid to get calcium rich foods in their diet. There'll be a small amount in your dark leafy greens. You can also get uh, milk alternatives, your nut milk, soy milks, and things of that such, as well, as well as yogurts and cheeses and things like that. So there are other options, but we don't want your kid only to be having dairy because again, it will lead to nutritional deficiencies in other areas as well. A lot of good questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. Um, I don't know if the three of you have any parting words, but um, thank you so much for all of the information that you've shared today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, thanks again to everyone who was able to tune in. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about HSS, um, please feel free to visit us at hss.edu. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.